Hello, my name is Tom Jackson, and I am about as primed as one can actually be to start digging deep. I'm Mark Sutcliffe. Welcome to Digging Deep, presented by Zen Books and Abacus Data. This is the latest in our series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with interesting, thoughtful, accomplished people. They come from many different fields, astronauts, Olympic champions, entrepreneurs, musicians, performing artists, TV hosts, and more. We explore their stories, their challenges, their defining moments, and we learn from them the powerful lessons that we can apply to our own lives. We do that by starting off with some rapid-fire questions that reveal little pieces of information about the guest, and then we start digging deep into those stories and life lessons. Our guest today is the legendary and prolific actor, singer, and philanthropist Tom Jackson. Now, Tom's accomplishments are way too many to list here, but I'll share a few of them as an actor. He starred on the television show North of 60. He also appeared in Star Trek The Next Generation and in the movie Cold Pursuit, starring Liam Neeson. As a performing artist, Tom has released a number of albums, and he created the annual Christmas concert tour called The Huron Carol. That has raised millions of dollars for food banks and other charities during the holiday season. Tom was also the chancellor of Trent University. He has received honorary degrees from 10 different institutions. He was appointed an officer of the Order of Canada in 2000 and was recently named to the higher level of Companion of the Order of Canada. In our very wide-ranging and inspiring conversation, Tom talks about his incredible life story, which began when he was born on the One Arrow Reserve in Saskatchewan. After his family later moved to Winnipeg, he ended up living on the streets. He was also homeless after he moved to Toronto. Tom shares how he replaced a drug addiction with a love addiction. He talks about wonder, generosity, teamwork, charity, and from his experience in pool halls, how to take the cue out of their hands, which is his metaphor for taking action. Tom also talks about collaborating instead of negotiating. There are some powerful lessons there. And he shares why he thinks of love as a verb instead of a noun. Now, one last thing before we get started. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to the podcast and review it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Also, please share this with your network. And if you're looking for more information about this episode of the show, including links to anything we reference in our discussion, if you would like to read my daily blog, where I post every single day of the year, something very short, or subscribe to my newsletter, The Weekly Dig, which has five very quick items that I've learned about each week, please go to our website, letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. You can also find a link to my TEDx talk. Now, let's start digging deep with Tom Jackson. Tom Jackson, it is so great to welcome you to Digging Deep. I have admired your work for a long time. Uh, and we've met a couple of times and done interviews before, and and they are very memorable to me. I, you made a great impression on me with your your words and your integrity and your authenticity. So I'm really excited to have you on this episode of Digging Deep. Welcome to you. Well, uh, it's a little bit of a mutual admiration society. I watched your your presentation online, and uh, I feel like we're kindred spirits. Well, that's a very nice thing to say. That means so much. Thank you. So I want to talk a lot about your life because you have had a remarkable life. Let's go back to your childhood. And what would you say? I know you had some tough times in your younger years, but what would be your fondest childhood memory? Sticking my toes in the mud after jumping off of the oil can uh, into the little kind of what we called a pool, but really it was just a pond. Um, on my reserve, which is called One Arrow. I come from the One Arrow First Nation in Saskatchewan. That's my traditional territory. My dad was English and my mother was uh, Cree. 
Indian, uh, as they called us in the day. And, um, and my dad was very, he was a man, a man of peace. And it was quite interesting in my younger years. We lived in a canvas uh, topped wooden side tent with a pot bellied stove uh, for the first number of years of my life on the reserve. So in the summer, we go out near the pond and jump off the oil can and squiggle our toes in the mud. Sounds great. Who was your hero when you were 10 years old? The Lone Ranger. Really? Oh, no, maybe the other guy, the other guy probably. <laughs> Tonto? Ah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Well, first of all, I wasn't sure I was ever going to grow up, so I didn't have to worry about that, and I never actually did. Um, but I think I wanted to be a fireman or, or, or a policeman, but I think at the end of my 14th year, I believed I was going to be a priest. Really? Yeah, I was, uh, I actually went, the next step for me in my journey uh, at that time, I was uh, uh, in the church and the next step for me would have been the sanctuary. Wow. What is your life story in six words? I believe I am a vampire. Okay. We're coming to back to that one for sure. What's your greatest mistake and what did you learn from it? I fell from what I believed was grace uh, by digging a hole that I was the architect of and became the subject of substance abuse. And I wouldn't change a thing. What I learned from that is priceless. We'll come back to that. For okay. what do you feel most grateful? Being given the gift of compassion. What has been the best year of your life so far and why? I think this year. And why do you uh, say that? And I think what, what, what I learned this year, what we became armed with this year was necessity. And it caused the sheer weight of the COVID event, uh, the, the sheer magnitude caused me to check myself at the door and say, well, wait a minute, is this where I want to be? And the choice became obvious that I totally belonged here in the heat of the battle because I'd been armed all these years and now it was a call to arms to use everything that I knew and know to fight this battle. What was the toughest year of your life so far and why? I think uh, 1988, again, I go back to that, oh, woe is me moment, but it's not actually woe is me. It's like, it's, I came out of the woe is me moment to the woe, it's me. <laughs> but I took everything that I loved and knew and stuck it in a needle and stuck that needle in my arm. What one person has had the greatest impact on your life? Paul Simon. What is the most important lesson that you would share with other people? That if you want to be successful in whatever field that you choose, you will find success richer and deeper if you do what you do for somebody else. I know that's a big theme of what you talk about uh, regularly, so we will come back to that. What is the biggest factor that you would say led you to where you are today? Understanding that love is a verb, not a word. What would people be most surprised to learn about you? 
that I at one point believed I was a reasonable snooker player, that I'm a pretty good backgammon player, and I'm a 2200 ranked chess player. Wow. So it, I'm a, what you wouldn't necessarily know about me is that I'm a games guy. Right. That doesn't totally surprise me. I don't think I'd want to take you on in any of those. <laughs> well, you probably wouldn't see me in, these days too many, in too many situations where that would actually come up. <laughs> what is your secret talent? I don't have one. Wait a minute. Let me think. Okay. This is so secret. Oh, this is really secret. Okay. I like it. I'm a funny guy. <laughs> Just really a deep secret. I like it. Are you more funny with your the people who are really close to you than you are when you're sort of more the public Tom Jackson? Well, the people who are really close to me have heard my jokes. So it's a tell-all. <laughs> <laughs> but I write new jokes every day. Okay. And, uh, but I don't necessarily get resounding gales of laughter from my darling Allison, but I can hear the laughter. Well, you know, here's the great thing is you can never hear a smile. Right. What is the most fun you've ever had? It was seeing and hearing Lady Gaga live. When was that? Well, I didn't, it wasn't. It was a dream. It happened in a dream. Okay. I saw her live. What's the scariest thing you've ever done? I went sailing. What is your boldest prediction for the future? That people will come to believe that they can be healthy and will be healthy before they need a pill. What would be the message of your commencement address? I know you've been involved in education. You've been a university chancellor. If you were giving an address to a group of students, what would you say? In two sentences, I would, it would be questions. I would ask you, if you'd like to see a better world, say I. Okay, maybe some of you would. If you'd like to see a better world, say I. If you'd like to see a better world, Say love. What has been a recent epiphany for you? Something about which maybe you've changed your mind. This just happened the other day. I realized that what I thought I knew was too complex. And in order to bring it to a better understanding, I had to simplify it. And that epiphany was very enlightening to me because i realized that once there were tasks that I was about to put into writing and to share with others that were worldly, but not my world. And my world is not ready for those tasks. My world is much simpler. When I say I want to engage with your community to set a a list of tasks that we can accomplish that are accomplished that are within our reach. Um, I realized I was asking to be ready for the end result and not for the first result. What book are you most likely to recommend to others? Is there a book that's had a big impact on you that you recommend to other people? I don't generally read books, but I did read something I wrote. And um, here, I'll show it to you. You see that? Yeah. 364 Timeless Wisdom for Modern Times. What I did, and I go to it often, because, and that's why it's just arm's length away. You can find it, you know, go look up 364, timeless wisdom from modern times. It's 364 thoughts, thought provoking ideas, all positive reinforcement that, and then it has lines below it that you can write on. And the reason this exists is because it was designed to have others write a book 
So I now do it myself. I'm probably on my third copy. <laughs> mm. But when I need to feel better, I need to find something that was written, which I paraphrased or came from my mom or, or my dad. And because I used to write things on a shoebox, I could reach over there, but I won't. There's a shoebox just over in the corner there. But it's all a bunch of, <laughs> you should see my office. Maybe you're like this. Do you make a lot of notes? Out. Yeah, you're jotting yeah, things there's, down there's, all the time. There you go. Shoebox notes. I call them shoebox notes. Yeah. And I used I, to do that, and so, now I do it in the computer. Well, smart. Good for you. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I, I I ask people what they do, and sometimes they say they're writers, and I say, well, "Where's your pen and paper?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is great. Yeah. I, I, let's pause there. I appreciate you answering all those questions. In just a moment, we're going to start digging deep with Tom Jackson. We're just going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit more about the presenting sponsor of Digging Deep, ZenBooks. ZenBooks is Canada's go-to cloud accounting firm. They are not your typical accounting firm. I know the founders, Colin and Eric. I've worked with them for several years. And here's why I think you should consider working with them, too. First of all, they bring a fresh, unique, modern approach to what is a very old-fashioned industry. These guys were working remotely and in the cloud long before it became cool. ZenBooks also uses technology to your advantage. I think this is really important. They give you the tools and analysis you need to monitor your business in real time. That's so valuable right now when everything changes so quickly. Yes, they're a virtual accounting firm, but that doesn't mean they're offshore, and it doesn't mean they're inattentive. ZenBooks combines the efficiency and effectiveness of a cloud accounting service with all the benefits that you'd want from a trusted advisor, high-level advice, and strategic support. Now, here's what I think is going to happen if you work with ZenBooks. You'll probably start out taking advantage of their cutting-edge cloud accounting solutions. But in the long run, I think you'll stay with them because of their strategic guidance and problem-solving. Among their core values, they specifically list being candid and proactive. Isn't that exactly what you want from a trusted advisor? Look, even if you're already working with an accountant or a bookkeeper or you have some accounting staff on your team, I think you should still talk to ZenBooks and learn more about their tools and their expertise. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. That's zenbooks.ca. Digging Deep is all about helping you make better decisions, and so is Abacus Data. Most leaders struggle to connect with and engage their audiences. Why is that? It's because they aren't sure how they think and feel and how they will react. Abacus Data can give you the strategic insights you need to make better decisions and to make them confidently. Here's a good example. A major national union was recently negotiating a new agreement for its thousands of members. This had the potential to be a very difficult process. There were many competing interests. So they brought in Abacus Data to conduct thorough and detailed research of their members to learn exactly where they stood, what they were thinking, what they wanted. And as a result, they were able to secure a strong new deal that was accepted overwhelmingly in a national vote. Abacus Data helps all of its clients understand what's really happening in the minds of their employees, clients, and stakeholders. They help them avoid costly blind spots. And they're really good at what they do. In fact, Abacus Data was one of the most accurate pollsters in the 2019 Canadian federal election. Make the one decision that will improve all of your other decisions. Let Abacus Data help you move forward with confidence and clarity. Go to abacusdata.ca. That's abacusdata.ca. Tom, once again, it's a real pleasure to speak with you today. And I want to go back to your childhood. Uh, as you mentioned, you were born on reserve and you ended up, I believe, living in Winnipeg. Um, and 
you dropped out of school and you were living on the streets. Can you tell me about your childhood and, and that experience, uh, the first of two very significant experiences in your life where, where you were in, in a pretty rough patch, I would say, at least from my perspective. Um, it's a little misleading in that most of my experiences were by choice. Um, so when I was growing up, I was, my dad was in the Air Force. He joined the Air Force. He was in the, the forces during the war. He was in the Army. And then after that, uh, what I talked about when, he, when I was born on the reserve, my dad was working with the CNR. And um, we moved from the, the tent to a place where my dad uh, put a spade shovel in the ground and we built a house. Uh, but it was right next to the track and my dad was a brakeman. So to get fuel for our, our pot-bellied stove, which was, for the first season was just, our home was a, a hole in the ground with a canvas top and a pot-bellied stove because my dad started to build the house a little late in the season. So, so we never got wow. the siding. Anyway, but it was a glorious world. It was great. And my sister and I used to go down the track uh, and pick the coal off the side of the track because my dad was a brakeman and the, and the train was nearby and when it would slow down, the coal would fall off the track, off the, off the train. Um, in, you know, uh, along with that and planting radishes and eating the radishes along with the mud, and having the time of our lives for the most part of my, my being a little guy. And then, then my uh, dad joined the Air Force and we got stationed in uh, Nemeo, which is Lancaster Park, north of Edmonton. So we were you know, I've, all of a sudden my, my surroundings changed and then my sister and I and my mom were only, the only dark skinned people in the community. So anything that happened when we were there, we just assumed was the way life was. And, uh, and there were some questionable things that took place, but there was, it was also very grand because again, my dad um, was a man of peace and my mom was very gregarious and very happy and and, and then my dad was going to retire and he put his time into the services. They gave him a bit of a, a chariot out by saying, where would you like to settle? Because uh, we'll give you a transfer and then you can take your retirement. And he chose Winnipeg. So when I got to Winnipeg, and this is when I was 14 years old, uh, life was very different because this was the city not a small town, not a reserve, and, um, and lots of lights. And I dropped out of school and went on my own and uh, ran with, let's call it gangs, if you want to call it that, buddies mostly, guys and girls, and lived on the street. But to go back to the point, this is not what was me. It was wonderful camaraderie. It, I wouldn't change that for a second. The people that I met that I loved, that loved me, um, our culture, although a little maybe subculture, uh, was, was a very grand experience. And it was a university of sorts. Um, let's call it the University of Pool. I, it was terrific. I mean, you, you learn, yeah, camaraderie, but you learn principles, you learned about integrity, you learned about a lot of things that you could take away from that experience and apply it as I did in later in life. Um, so that was a form of education for you, that, that period absolutely. of your life being around other people and, and living on the street and, and running with that group. Yep. And one of the greatest, greatest things I learned in the, the pool hall world in that university, um, I was playing a guy, his name was Billy Warbinick. And it, for those folks in Winnipeg would maybe know Billy or snooker fans might know Billy and they might be more familiar with Cliff Thorburn, who was the world champion. Billy became 10th ranked in the world, but he was from Winnipeg and, and, um, and I was once 
playing him and Cliff was coming through town. I know Cliff as well. And I, I asked Cliff, I said, as a world champion, here you are. Got any hints? <laughs> Here's Billy. He's in the rank number 10. And he looked at me and he said, take the cue out of his hands. I said, what? Take the cue out of his hands. Don't let him get up to the table. Run the balls. Make all the balls. The great lesson to that is to say, if you play eight ball, have you ever played eight ball? Yep. So, so you know the rules. You, you know, you got to make seven balls and you shoot the eight. And if you plan how you make the last ball first and the next one before it and the next one before it, you're likely to run the table because you're going to know how you make the last one. So you're going to answer all of the questions before they're asked. So in your business plan, make sure you answer all the questions before they're asked and you won't be scrutinized. People will believe you. You'll have credibility. And I, I use that practice a lot now. See, I used to, I used to sleep underneath uh, the bench outside of the University of Winnipeg. And I used to lay there at night looking at this historic building. And I used to wonder how glorious it must be behind those walls. How wonderful it must be, how safe it must be. And now my world has exposed all of that to be exactly what I thought it was. Um, I've now, I'm only telling you this because it's a tickle. Um, I have 10 honorary doctorates. And I've had the opportunity, the glorious opportunity to be the chancellor at Trent University and to speak to all of those graduates. And we got to talk and really it was a one-way conversation, but the conversation kind of came from here is that you did all you did in a glorious fashion and you got to where you are and you owned this moment but you probably didn't do it by yourself it was probably teamwork that got you here yes you did the work but it was probably teamwork somebody along the way helped you so as you move along in your world remember to turn around you know, remember to look in the rearview mirror every once in a while, just in case there's somebody there that might need a little help. So you have 10 honorary doctorates and you were a chancellor of a university, but at one point you were sleeping under a bench looking in at a university in Winnipeg, living on the street. That's a remarkable story. It's a wonderful journey. I want to make sure that I get to a couple of points later in my life. I mean, I know that this, yeah. this, we'll, this we'll dark yeah. place in my world and it's, you know, yeah, it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And you ever, everybody wants to hear about that stuff. Okay. Yeah, sure. And everything, there's a lot of stuff that's hazy to me. Um, but let me tell you this. If anybody ever tells you something about me that might be a little dark Go ahead and believe it because I probably, that was probably me someplace along the way. So I'm never going to, I'm never going to, you know, short you on that, that side. But what, what's really valuable is the parts that allow me to say I'm that vampire. So let's come back to that. You said, uh, and, and before we do, I just want to highlight, you know, I love that lesson, take the cue out of his hands. In other words, if, if you want to win against somebody good, don't let them take their shot, right? You, that's right? you control it, never let them take a shot. And that's such a valuable lesson in so many ways. So uh, let's highlight that. But uh, you said, I believe I am a vampire. You got to tell me the story behind that. When I lived in the hole in the ground, the creator came to me 
And we were talking, you know, just like you and I are talking. I have a little conversation. And he said, oh, maybe he thought I was an okay guy. So he says, you know, I'm going to do you a favor. He said, I'm going to send you someone who is worse off than you. I'm going to send you an angel. And if you help that angel, I'm going to help you. I thought that was a pretty good idea. So I said, okay. But he didn't tell me where to find the angel. So I went out right away. And I found a guy laying on the street. And he was in trouble. And I won't belabor that story. I didn't actually lift him up or do any of that. I just went to the bar and got somebody to call an ambulance. That's all I did. But he was okay. Turned out he was okay. He had been laying on the street and he had some kind of incident that paralyzed him but left him conscious. And people were walking by. And I went back to my crawl space and it terrified me. I thought, what if that was me? What if I was laying there dying and people were just walking by? I mean, I know what it feels like. Everybody knows what it feels like. Sometimes you see somebody on the street and you get half a block away and you think, well, maybe I should cross over here. Well, such was the case that I didn't. And when I got home thinking about this might have been me, maybe it was, that it was a terrifying thought. Get over that quickly, because what I really felt was a whole other thing that had happened to me. The thing that I was trapped in all of a sudden became unlocked. And all of a sudden I could breathe, I could see, I could taste. I was higher than I had ever been. It cost me nothing and it lasts forever. I became addicted to love. You're a vampire of love. <laughs> <laughs> so did, did was this when uh, we talked about when you were on the streets of Winnipeg, but <clears throat> it was later in your life that you, oh, much later. yeah. Tell me, tell me how you got to that point, because this was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was in your late thirties um, that, that you uh, started to have addiction issues. Is that right? Well, yeah, there's a, a real there's a real chapter between when I was with Bernie on the street and the time that I went dug a hole in Toronto to live in. There's a mm-hmm. whole other world in there. Um, it, you know, it, it, I became uh, a singer. I was a broadcaster. I owned restaurants. I was very successful in my world. Uh, I took all of that and all of the people that I loved and put it in a needle and stuck it in my arm. And why did that happen? What happened? I was just a fool, you know, and it did. I won't blame. I can't blame that on anybody. We don't want to blame it on anybody. Why did it happen? Because I liked it. That, you know, I liked doing cocaine. It was fun. It was deadly, but trust me, that's what's wrong with it is that it takes over your whole life or takes your whole life. And so I, I wasn't, that's why I say I was the architect of it. You know? Right. So all of those great things happened up to that point. You know, the I, reason I went to Toronto was I wanted to pursue a career in acting. But I sold a restaurant to do that, right? I went to Toronto, high on the hog, you know? Uh, and then, then all that goes through that dark period. And the reason that I'm even here talking to you is because I became a a recognizable person, but that only happened because I was a vampire. That only happened because I went back to Winnipeg with my tail between my legs because we had done a project called the Huron Carol the first time in a place called the Buck, downtown Toronto, the Silver Dollar. You know that? You know where it is? I don't know that place, no. 
Yeah, well, it's it's still around. You know, I went, I did Memory Walk a couple of years ago, and it's still around. But it was, it had been closed in 1987 or 88, and the city allowed us, me and my friends, to open it up for one night to do a, to do a, a, a show to raise money for council fires so they could have hampers for people in downtown Toronto. And we didn't raise much money, but we did raise awareness because we had people like you. We had people in this mix that we could rely on to spread the word. We raised literally eh, 200 bucks. I don't know, not much. Mm. But there were, the day after, there were cars and trucks all the way from Parliament and Girard all the way to the freeway, which is, you know, two or three kilometers or so. Cars and trucks delivering food. Wow. And realization that you could actually do something came in that period. And uh, I went back to Winnipeg with my tail between my legs and thought to myself that I had to try and figure out, because my, all my troops, my boys, they asked, What's, how did you get in this mess? And how did you get here? How did you get back home? And I told them, and they said, we got to do something. And it was the 20th of December. And by the 24th, we had organized the first of an annual event that still happens today on Christmas Eve, where we go out and we pick up people that are stranded on the street and we bring them in cars and we find dine them and we take them back to wherever it is they want to go in the streets of Winnipeg. And it's now, it's a, it's a now a big operation, but at the time, my thirst for the oxygen that I had been given. See, what I, when, I, when that trap opened that I talked about, the key to the trap that opened the trap was also the key that opened the door to paradise. But I didn't know that. But it did. And I had to find a way to get credibility so here you, here you go. Here's a guy, he's 38 years old, he's a six foot five Indian with a braid, a drug addict, and he wants some credibility. How the hell do you get credibility? So I called a friend of mine and I said, I got two favors I need to ask you. He said, what? And he said, I need to carry cables. Can you give me a job carrying cables? And he said, sure. He said, what's the other? I said, I need you to stand with me. I need you to be right here beside me for a little while. And then we'd have to find somebody else. And then find somebody else. And all of a sudden we had a little, a little troop of people who had lots of credibility that were standing with me. And we created this thing called the Christmas and Winter Relief Association. And the Christmas and Winter Relief Association has raised $230 million for food banks, service agencies, cash and in-kind services, not just cash, but since then. But it couldn't happen unless we had some kind of credibility. So then I had to figure out how to sing. And then I had to figure out how to act. And, but they were all means to an end. It was all just to, just to get some credibility so people would listen to this old man who stands on a soapbox and goes, whoa, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so did you replace a drug addiction with an addiction to helping other people effectively? Is that what happened? Yeah, I, I replaced a drug addiction with a love addiction. And how hard was it for you to get off the drugs? It, it took a, a really long time. Um, and if it wasn't again for my darling Allison, see, the, the creator sent me two angels. He didn't send me. He was, well, maybe Allison was the first one. I have no idea. <laughs> but Allison fell in love with a drug addict. And, uh, and, you know, it's really been our collective journey. Um, so we you know, moved on from being in Winnipeg and being, this company of two with a lot of unbelievable, undeniable, 
on relinquishing friendship and love from our family and team. So it, it, if it wasn't for her and her commitment, I don't know where I'd be because you don't you always get along just by yourself. You need, you need partners and you need support. And um, so it took, you know, a long time to do, to get that. But I think really, you know, it's a novel and there's good stuff and there's bad stuff, but there's more, way more good stuff than bad. Although I may be talking a lot about the bad stuff. It's really all the good stuff. Um, sure, but that's, that's the well, foundation, that's, right? That was, that's, that's what, that's what you built upon was, was the lessons from those experiences, right? Right. And, some of the, some of the, but some of the experiences, Mark, are not, I don't know that they're worth it. Like, I'm not sure, like the, the last time I did drugs was the last time I saw my best friend who was on his deathbed, who died from an overdose. That's the last time. And that was a long time ago. I quit smoking. I mean, it's, these are hard lessons. I quit smoking because I went to a friend of mine's funeral and he had died from the results of smoke. So there are, those are hard lessons and we all go through them. Here's, here's now a fast forward to something is through all of that, those tragic but wonderful benchmarks came to learn something about myself by not necessarily trying to make people not go down my path. I say again, because it was a, it's a great path and it brought me here to you. But I need to now, I am fully enthralled with helping people become healthy. Right. To helping them be healthy uh, in, in mind and body without medical prescription. I'm not saying don't take a pill. I'm not saying that. Yeah. Oh, don't, don't, please don't hear me say that. I, that's not what I said. But the collaboration between uh, creating health for yourself and, um, and the good counsel that you have uh, in your medical world. Ultimately, the need for that medical world is going to phase out a bit more because you're going to become healthy. You won't need the high blood pressure pill so to speak. Right. So let's come at this from another angle, which is how, tell me about how you got into music and then acting. Just uh, tell me a little bit about that. Well, that was okay. The, the music thing I'd have to go back. Now you're going way back to the second yeah. chapter, you know, <laughs> we're in the 10th, 7th, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, how you go back. <laughs> Yeah, so ch chapter one, I think, is the streets of Winnipeg, and chapter two is that period in between there and Toronto, right? So, so let's let's, yeah. let's go to chapter one. I was once, I had a repertoire of three songs, and they were all poorly played, but they were a repertoire, and I was sitting in some basement somewhere howling my repertoire of three songs, and there was a guy there who did a public access radio show. Um, at CFR, no, CKRC in uh, Winnipeg. And his name was Isaac Bolio. And Isaac said, would you like to come on my show and sing your songs? And I thought I'd hit the big dime. Right? Going to be on the radio. Yeah. Going to sing. So I went and I did this. And before I left, uh, the station manager came out and he said, Tom, he said, um, have you ever considered doing radio? And, uh, you know, whatever. Took my guitar, wrapped it up downstairs, out into the winter cold. And I walked two blocks and I stopped. And then I walked back to the radio station and I said to the guy, why did you ask that question? And he said, well, I got this idea. And I eventually, uh, on, a, on a week where Isaac was not well, I took over his show. 
and shortly after that. So my world is pretty much time and place, just dumb luck. Um, for sure, you have to leverage those opportunities as best you can. But I get a call from CBC and uh, somebody uh, called me and said, we'd like to talk to you about doing radio. And it was shortly thereafter, I had a full-time assignment and a, and a weekly show on CBC radio. And you had to, you know, again, it was a lot, it was luck because at that time I, well, good afternoon. My name is Tom Jackson. You're listening to 94.3 on your FM dial. Cause you, you certainly had to got no voice there. for it, Tom. You, you, had to be, you had to be there in that yeah. range to do FM radio back oh, then. Oh yeah. Right? No, you've got the, it's funny that there's a, an author named Chris Voss, who is uh, a former FBI negotiator. And he talks about how, if you need, if you want to calm down the people uh, you're negotiating with, you've got to use your FM DJ voice, your late night FM DJ voice. And you've got the late night FM DJ voice. And well, more. thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. Tom, sh share with me your thoughts uh, from the, the leadership role that you've played and from the observations that you've had over a lifetime, uh, what are your thoughts on systemic racism and on what reconciliation means to you? Because I know you've, been, you've spoken about this a lot. We weren't taught. We weren't born with hate. You know, we were not. It was a taught thing. And that's because, in my opinion, that we distance ourselves from our home. We distance ourselves from what love was. And the farther we get from home, the farther we get from that impulse and that understanding. This is a little off the mark, but my, my brother, I, I, he says, you don't hate anybody. I go, oh, you're right. You're not even Trump, he says. I said, no, I don't. But let me tell you this. I'll tell, let me tell you what I do hate. I hate misogyny. I hate oppression. I hate tyranny. I hate bigotry. And I hate racism. I don't hate Trump. Take what you want from that. We have to find a way to collaborate. There's a situation today on the East Coast. There's lobster fishermen that are non-native and there's lobster fishermen that are. Collaborate. Get in a room. Because they don't hate each other. They don't. I'm saying, okay, could we not just get in a room and agree that we want to collaborate? We don't want to negotiate. We want to collaborate. And I, I can promise you this. When you come out of the room, you're not going to be perfect. That's for sure. But you are going to be better. And what if you went in the room twice? Or what if you went into the room three times? See, if we can find ways to collaborate, we can lower the bar on racism and on hate. Let me drill down on that a little bit first, because I think that's really powerful. Collaborate, not negotiate. I think that speaks to a mindset of abundance rather than scarcity, right? And that scarcity is what sometimes drives fear and hatred. Things like there's only so many jobs to go around, so we can't let more people into the country, or uh, there's only so many resources to go around, so if other people have access to them, that means I don't. That sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Let's combine some thoughts here, because I remember what your other question was on truth and reconciliation. Yeah. There's some things that are like they're in front of you. And I won't say they can't be changed. What I can say is if you have the will to change them, they can be changed. It's an old cliche. If you want to see change, then you got to change. You have to change if you want to see change. That's right. Yeah. Correct. 
Um, you can't just keep doing the same thing over if you want it to change. It's not going to change. Yeah. And the change uh, has to start with you, right? You, you right. can't go out and change other things. You have to change yourself. It's one thing to acknowledge something. It's another thing to do something about it. Yeah. I work with an organization called the Dope Team, which stands for Downtown Outreach Addictions Partnership. Right. D-O-A-P, right? That's correct. Yeah. And um, we are, uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a, uh, a recovery center. It's a detox for the most part. But the Dope Team is a crisis transport unit, which that's what I do. But I happen to be uh, in the center, and there was a guy named Greg, and and he was talking to my upline, and and he was just going on about how terrible it is. He says, I'm 60 years old, and he said, I, I go to the temp line, and, and all the young guys get the jobs, and and, you know, it goes, it happened over and over and over and over and over and over. And I end up on the floor on this mat. And he went on for got to be 10 minutes. And, and then he stopped and he looked over at me and he says, are you Tom Jackson? And I said, yeah. So he starts telling me the same story. Like with even more energy than he did when he was talking to Adam, my, my uh, upline. And I had to stop him somewhere in this first minute. And I said, Greg, listen, I, uh, my doctor tells me I'm going to be good up until 90. So I have 20 years left. Are you going to take 10 minutes of my life and tell me exactly what you just told him? Or would you rather make a plan? Would you rather make a plan? Because that's, I get it. That's the truth. Now do you want to do something about it? That's reconciliation. So I said, what do you want to do? If you want to make a plan? He said, yeah. I said, that's the first step. Right. So it's, it's not about, I mean, obviously there has to be acknowledgement. There has to be sharing. There has to be storytelling. There has to be truth. But but are you saying you've got to move to the action, to to the to the effort after that, rather than just sort of dwelling on the facts? I wouldn't put it that way. Okay. I wouldn't say rather than just, you know, mm -hmm. I would simply say, okay, let's be just to this, not just us, right? Justice, not just us. Let's take what this is and acknowledge that it's true. The truth part. But you don't have to tell me the truth part three times. Okay, even if you have to, all right, fine. I'm there for you. But while we're doing that, let's make a plan. My question is, do you want to make a plan? Because if you do, that's the first step. Let's make a path. What's the next step? What do you want to do tomorrow? We're going to make a plan. That's the first step. Okay, we're going to do something tomorrow. We're committed to do that. Well, I, then I ask you this. Why wait till tomorrow? Make today your tomorrow. And I'll whine about it. And I'll talk in a squeaky little voice. <laughs> or I'll say, okay, let's take today and do something. Let's make a plan. We know what the destiny of this journey is going to be. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be a straight path. It's going to have to find itself but we know what the destiny is and it's a whole lot better than what this is. So I want to come back to collaborate, not negotiate. Can you talk about how you achieve that, how you get people to collaborate rather, rather than negotiate, how you get them to think in those terms? If we, A, you don't get to go in the room if you haven't agreed that we're going to collaborate. If you don't want to collaborate, you don't get invited to the party. And you have to tell me, if, you, if you're looking for a reason, you're the one that has to find the reason. You don't go in the room unless you have a reason. You have to have a why that is strong enough. And if it doesn't make you cry, it's not strong enough. Your why doesn't make you cry, I don't believe you. Okay, so now we're going to go in the room. And now we're there for the sole purpose of collaboration. 
I'm there to listen to you. I'm not there to talk to you while you're while you're talking. I'm going to give you a talking stick. And as long as you have that talking stick, I'm not going to say anything. And when you're done, you're going to pass that to some, the guy next to you. And he's going to get the talking stick. And he's going to talk until he said his piece. And then he's going to pass it to the woman next to him. And she's going to talk. And then she's going to pass it on. And we're going to talk until that stick stops moving. Now we all know where we sit. Now, there's a process which I'll, I'll abbreviate this next piece because you'll run out of time. But I, I, I would be asking the question of the person across from me, what do, you, what do you assume about me? Tell me what you think. Tell me what your assumptions are about me. And I'll tell you my assumptions about you. And then I'll hand it to you. You tell me what, what on that sheet is not correct. Tell me where in that sheet, what, my, what assumptions aren't correct so that I'll know that I'm not assuming something about you. And now I'll understand you. So we'll understand our predicament better if we understand that understanding is sharing. Right. Right. I wanted to talk about health because you speak about that and you talk about moving towards health without a medical prescription. And, and I, I think you described it very well, acknowledging that there is a role for medicine, but that there is so much to health that doesn't involve medicine. Tell me a little bit about your own health practices and how you try to help live a healthy life now, especially as someone who has been through so much in your life, including addiction. Well, let me give you a, a, a living example. And it covers off a lot of bases and covers off in particular something I want to talk about. When, the, when COVID became part of our life, the sheer weight of that and the impact of that made us all reassess a lot of things. But the, the byproduct of a lot of it was we had to reintroduce ourselves to our families just by protocols, if you just use that. I had a conversation with a, a gentleman in the entertainment business and talking about this idea of putting like-minded entertainers together to help other entertainers. And he said, well, that's a cool idea, but, you know, that's not really cool. I mean, young people, you know, they're not good. That's not cool. And I said, well, wait a minute. If we're going to do something. What we did is we created this series called Almighty Voices. And if you go to almightyvoices.ca, you'll see any one of 12 episodes that we produced to raise money for the Unison Benevolent Fund, which is an organization that is so purposed to helping musicians in crisis. And so we created a, an opportunity by having entertainers do a weekly show uh, and a call to action. And there, our con my conversation with my friend um, turned around because it was his son that said it to him. And I said, and when did he say it? Said, well, you were sitting at home because you had to be at home, right? So the idea was to, to reverse that whole thought and make it cool because we're trying to reconnect with our family. And those days may be gone, but they may be back when you sat around and had Sunday dinner and you watched Ed Sullivan or something, if you remember Ed Sullivan. Um, north of 60. Sit around, you know, or north of 60. And it became evident that what we were talking about was true. So we produced this event and it was infused with creating health. So if you haven't done it, do yourself a favor and go and look at episode 11 or episode 12, because the prime minister was on episode 12. The governor general was on episode 12. The lieutenant governor from Alberta was on episode 12. Buffy St. Marie was on episode 12. Wow. Go, go have a look. The orchestra, the Calgary Symphony Orchestra was on. 
the Philharmonic from Edmonton, Oilers, Calgary, Flames, they were on that wow. show. And you know why? Because there was a common goal. Because it made them feel good. Because they were getting healthy by doing what, what they were doing. Because they were doing something for somebody else. It's long lasting. It's a high and it lasts forever. And it costs nothing. I, I want to drill into that because you've spoken many times about this, about doing something for somebody else, making your life about helping others. And you've done that in so many different ways from the Huron Carol to the Dreamcatcher project that you did after one of your co-stars took his own life tragically. Um, you've done so many different things. So tell me more about that high of helping others. Let me start by the high of helping yourself and then taking that and sharing that. The, the emotion, the feeling, I could take you to the dark side of the moon and back and, and, and to have you land in the happiest place you've ever seen and bring you back home and, and take you for a coffee and get you to buy somebody a coffee. That would be an experience. But here's another one. And this is the DNA of what I'm talking about. Do me a favor and close your eyes for five seconds. Think of three things that make you happy. Now open your eyes. Now do you feel just a little bit better than you did five seconds ago? Of course. That's the DNA of what we do. That's what we help people find within themselves. When you opened your eyes, the reality is you had empowered yourself. And when you opened your eyes, that was as powerful a moment that you will ever have in your whole life. Why? Because nobody can take that from you. No one ever can take that from you. So when you open your eyes, so now when we finish this, I want you to do that again. And when we finish our conversation, we do this. And when you open your eyes, go and do something for somebody right away with intent. You'll never be the same ever. I promise you. And it works every time. I believe it. You talked about love and you said something very powerful about that, that I have come to understand as well. And that is that love is a verb. I think when we grow up, we think of love as a feeling that when you say, I love someone else, when you look at someone else, a family member, your partner, and you say, I love you, you are initially describing a feeling, but what love is ultimately are the actions that you take. You, you're choosing to act with love towards another person. Is that what you mean by that? Is that, is that how you would describe it? Yeah. And, and, it, and that's the micro. The macro is taking that example and teaching others to use it, to engaging them in that process, prevent, uh, provide them with something, a vehicle by which they can understand that. The Huron Carol is one of those things. And I want, I want to dig into that for a second because it, it, let me just say this, that if you have, the Huron Carol is, is infused with all of those wonderful things that we need as a family, but we need it as much now as we ever needed it. It comes infused with hope, compassion, empathy, the verb, and it comes with Christmas. If we believe in all of those things, and if, if any of your listeners, or the people that tune in, have an organization or work with an organization that cannot, because of the current situation, with COVID raise much needed funds for this Christmas. If you're that organization, then I want you to come and find me 
because the Huron Carroll is designed this year virtually for organizations to raise funds. You won't go to the theater. You'll buy it. Your, your organization will have this and they can sell tickets. I'll give them a thousand seats in a theater, but they're not a thousand seats. There are a thousand screens. Sure. And, and they can sell those seats. Let's call it $10 and they can collect money in a cap in hand and say they have four people watching it. That would be 4,000 people at the end of the day. What if they all put a little money in a cap? And what if that went to the food bank? What if you did that four times? It's unbelievable how powerful this opportunity is at this place in time. How much have and you raised and how many shows have you done in the past? To give you an example of last year, we toured and, and we can safely say that was somewhere in the area of six million dollars wow um but we can't go this year yeah can't go to the theaters so that we've created this virtual opportunity we went out to vancouver to white rock into a theater that was um compliant to the covid protocols and we recorded the huron carol and we're now offering the huron carol to be leveraged for organizations, I, a lot of food banks. We have 26 communities right now or so um, that are that will leverage this to raise money for their organizations. And it, uh, if you have a, a community hockey team, it doesn't matter, right. whatever right. it is. You and I talked about the possibility of uh, hooking up with, with Peter over at the mission. Yeah, the Ottawa uh, mission. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I'm hoping to hear back from Peter. But the, but the point is simply this that, that this would be a great opportunity for the mission to have 4,000 people know about the mission because I'm going to give them 1,000 screens. Yeah. Right. And he's Incredible. going to promote that to 1,000 people. Yeah. We're going to promote it to four people or just have their family sit around and, and experience, you know, that that spirit. So let's come back to love as a verb, because I really think it is a powerful distinction. Uh, and it changes your outlook because it's a feeling can stop, but the, your choice to love other people doesn't have to stop. Right. And that's the, th that's to me is one of the most powerful lessons of life is that you can continue to act with love towards others uh, and, and, and that that can drive the relationships in your life much more powerfully than any, any feeling you have. And you, yes, it's the answer. You, you thrive off it once you've felt it. You only have to do it once with commitment and concentration and cherish that because you can go back and back and back and you'll find that each time you do something, it'll be unique onto itself and it'll come with a unique memory. Give you an example. When I was, it was winter time and my brother and I were gonna meet for a coffee and he got to the coffee shop before me and, and I was you know, in a bit of a hurry, but there was a girl standing on the corner and she had a box and she opened up the box and and I said, and I knew I was going to be right back. So I'll tell you, just wait, I'll be right back. But I, I got to go, but I'll be right back. So I went inside and uh, there was Bernie. And uh, first thing he said was, did you see that girl out there? I said, yeah. He said, Wasn't she amazing? I don't know. I didn't talk to her. And he said, well, she gave me this. And it was a piece of paper folded up and it had a message on it. And the message was something to the effect that said, I can't stop the rain and the snow, but I can give you hope. And I had walked right by her. I went back outside. And she was gone. But it was that moment that made me think to myself, do not deny someone the privilege of giving you a gift. And be, and now on the other side, no, I, it was just me realizing what the value of that gift could be. 
So I went, did the same thing. I stood on a corner, <laughs> started to sing, no guitar, but people would come and talk to me and find out where they came from. And, and we have a minute, you know? Hmm. Incredible. This has been so fascinating, Tom, and you, you have such wisdom and so many powerful lessons to share. Is there anything else that you want to leave people with based on the wealth of experience that you have uh, about this message that you, that you promote around living healthy, helping others, supporting other people, and, and really finding joy, I think. You haven't used that word, but I'll use it. Finding joy through making your life about others. Yeah. If you have, back up a little and just recognize that if you're waiting for this message, for me to deliver this message, if you're listening to this show, and if you think that this is a message from the creator that you can carry throughout your life, Here's the secret. You already have the message. If you want, if you're looking for the message from me, you already have it. But it's your message. It's your light. It's your intent that it will follow. But it's your light. You just have to close your eyes. Go look for it. Ah, there it is. Oh, look, there's a spark. Oh, it's a flame. Wait a minute. It's a fire. Is that an, an inferno that I see? And is that the fury that I can feel? Yes, it is. That's so powerful. Tom, this has been a real pleasure. I've learned so much. Every time I've spoken with you, I've cherished it. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for everything well, you do. Thanks. We can, I said this before. I can't do what I do if I don't have you. It's true. We're a family by, by choice. Tom, thank you so much. Likewise. When you hear Tom Jackson's voice, when you witness his storytelling ability, it's really no surprise why he's had so much success, not just as a performing artist, but in leading and motivating others to do great work in the community. His story is so powerful. I will remember for a long time some of what he shared, including about collaborating instead of negotiating, about going back in the room, and of course about love being a verb, an action, instead of a noun or a feeling. So once again, a big thank you to Tom Jackson for joining us on Digging Deep. And if you enjoyed this episode, please review it and share it with others. That will help us produce more great episodes. And if you want to keep digging deep into topics and lessons like this, or see the show notes, or subscribe to our weekly newsletter, or read my blog, you can do all of that at letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>